Hello, and welcome to Local Writers Read. Uh, we are here for our August event, and this is part two with our theme, Legacy and Inheritance. I'm here with my co-organizer, Claire Guyton, and uh, we'll be getting to introduce our wonderful guests today in just a moment. Um, before we do, as always, we just wanna give special mention to Quiet City Books, uh, independent bookstore in Lewiston, Maine, who hosts and has been a part of this series from, um, since its inception. And when we're able to get back to in-person events, we're looking very much forward to gathering there in person again. Um, and we are also co-sponsored by the Lewiston Public Library, um, which supports the arts and literacy um, in Lewiston, Auburn and the, for events around the state. Um, so th they both have supported the series for a long time and we're, we're very happy for um, what they've done for us and for the arts in general. Um, and for every um, event, we had part one of this reading last night. Um, be sure to tune in and check that out on Facebook or YouTube um, after the fact if you missed it. But we, we assign a theme and then we invite our readers to interpret the theme as broadly or widely as they care to. And so for August, we're looking at legacy and inheritance. And so le with last night's readers, we had um, family legacies of the Holocaust and of survival, but also looking at um, gravestones, memory, the, the legacy that a life leaves um, what, during and after um, in times past. And also we talked a lot about remembering and recording stories. And so today we have three more um, excellent main writers who are working in different forms and they will also be bringing their uh, perspective to this theme in whatever way they see. Um, so with that in mind, um, listen in, enjoy, uh, feel free to join the conversation in the Facebook chat, which I will be watching. Um, and I'll turn it over to Claire to introduce our readers today. Thank you, Josh. We said we'd be back and here we are. As Josh said, we'll have three more reflections, we can call them, on the meaning of legacy and inheritance. Anne Elliott is joining us again and will start us off. Anne is the author of the collection, The Art Stars, and a plowshare solo, The Beginning of the End of the Beginning. Her fiction appears in Story, A Public Space, Crab Orchard Review, Witness, Hobart, and elsewhere. She's been supported by the Story Foundation, Vermont Studio Center, Table 4 Writers Foundation, Tomales Bay Writers Workshop, The Normal School, Longleaf Writers Conference, and the Bridport Prize. We have another return guest today, Michelle Menting, who will follow Anne. Michelle teaches creative writing and poetry at USM and lives in a little red house in a small grove of woods overlooking a little branch of river in Midcoast, Maine. More information can be found online at michellementing.com. And finally, we're welcoming Morgan Talty to the series today. Morgan is a citizen of the Penobscot Nation where he grew up. He received his BA in Native American Studies from Dartmouth College and his MFA in Fiction from Stone Coast. His story collection, Night of the Living Res, is forthcoming from Tin House Books. His work has appeared in the Georgia Review, Shenandoah, Tri Quarterly, Narrative Magazine, Lit Hub, and elsewhere. He lives in Levant, Maine. We are so glad you wanted to join us, Morgan. So this is one of those times when our readings share elements of voice that make them sort of weave together in some mysterious way, at least they do for me. Um, I'm wondering if others will feel the same way. Um, maybe that's one of the things we can talk about in our chat. So thank you all for sharing your work with us this afternoon, as always. Um, I'm just so happy to hear you. And Anne, go ahead and get us started whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much to Claire and Josh for having me back to Quiet City Books, Lewiston Library, and thanks to all of you who are tuning in wherever you are in the world. Um, to set up uh, my uh, story selection here. It, this is from a series of stories in progress about an art historian traveling in Northern Europe to look at portraiture. And this story is set in Bruges, Belgium, where she's staying on a canal barge. And so I'm going to read two excerpts from a short story called Rooms. From Rooms. 
Felix's barge was painted several shades of mismatched, charmless institutional gray. It was moored on the edge of a parking lot jammed full of corporate looking tour buses. Jules teetered on a gangplank to the deck where she found a cluttered subsistence garden, its rows of kale poking defiantly through the snow. Strings of lights vined around rails, none matching in color or style, plastic chili peppers, bananas, Chinese lanterns. Garden gnomes peeked from behind a potted evergreen. One had to be on the barge to see its charm for the tour buses to recede. A hatch opened and a head popped up like a groundhog peeking from its den, Miss Johnson. Felix had a bald head, a gaunt weathered face and smiled warmly like his sister Merritt. Once inside, he stood in a permanent stoop so his head would not hit the ceiling, but his living area was surprisingly wide, big enough for a kitchenette, a couch, an easy chair, a heat stove, a dining table, and a petite Christmas tree by a picture window. Breathless, Jules dropped her bag to the floor and looked around at a riot of color. Everywhere, hung salong style, were small paintings, some the size of postcards, others larger, none bigger than a dinner plate. The media varied. Some had the flat brightness of gouache on paper, others held the light with the depth of oil on wood. All were framed. Jules could not control her curiosity, so she looked. Over a water cooler was a group of block printed seascapes with tall ships, a whale, an octopus. Next to the Christmas tree was a series of oval panels with head and shoulders portraits of dogs and cats like gentry. Behind the heating stove was a shelf of figurines of the world, American kachinas, African fetishes, Chinese lucky cats holding their paws up to say hi. A live cat brushed up against Jules's leg. That is Gretchen, said Felix. Please be careful. She does not go outside, but she wants to. Not a swimmer, Jules said. She reached down to pet the black fluffy coat. Gretchen, with glossy tufts poking from her ears like plumes, looked haughty and royal, dressed in black like an old Nederlander. She leaned into Jules's leg and purred. A tap on her back startled Jules. She turned around and faced a large gray parrot perched on a gooseneck lamp. He gets jealous, Felix said, when you pet Gretchen. The parrot bobbed his head and bulged his eyes. Should I pet him too? Show him your finger. He likes that. Jules obeyed. She had never been this close to a parrot before. The bird touched his tongue to her finger. Does he talk? When he has something to say. Can I ask you something? Jules said. Of course. Did you make all this art? Felix brushed back the plumes on the bird's head. Not in this room. These works are my friends. I like them around me. Jules couldn't tell if the friends were the paintings or their makers. Here are your keys. Your room is down this hall. Jules took a last look around. Beside the kitchenette was a small door, only knee high. She had mistaken it for a cabinet, but it had a porthole window filled with yellow light. It led somewhere. So Jules goes into town uh, and, and plays around in Bruges with all the tourists. And then she um, relaxes in her, in, her, uh, in her room and writes in her journal. And her room is this teeny tiny uh, room where she sleeps on a high berth over a cargo hold in what used to be the crew uh, area of the barge. Jules put her notebook down. She was thirsty. She half crawled, half fell out of the berth, put a big sweater over her pajamas, and tiptoed in stocking feet to refill her bottle from the water cooler in the living room. Felix must have been asleep. The pets were probably in his room. He had left a few lights on for her. She planted her feet apart to balance, then leaned in to view the cat and dog portrait series again. She had noticed the painting's precision earlier, but now everything was fuzzy. She was just about to go back to her room for reading glasses when she heard two people talking in French. Jules tiptoed closer to the sound. A woman asked a question, the same question, repeatedly, and a man patiently provided the same answer, echoing the woman's words. The woman sounded old, her voice breathless and scratchy. Who would bring an elderly woman to a rocking barge? Jules edged closer to the source of the voices behind a wall in the kitchenette. The knee-high door was ajar. 
Yellow light still glowed through its porthole. Jules bent down to listen. Yes, this was the source. One of the voices sounded like Felix. Did he live here with his mother? The male voice continued. No, no, no. Pa, ba, pa, ma, no. Demain? The female voice persisted. Abba, s'il te plaît, s'il te plaît, abba, abba. No, no, no. The man affected baby talk. Sati, tu veux ton sati? Okay, okay. Ya, yeah, ya yeah, was the reply, but the voice lower and Dutch. Aus du blief, aus du blief. It sounded almost like Felix. Wait, was Felix talking to the parrot? Jules heard the scratchy circles of a vinyl record, then spare warm piano chords, then a squawk. Ça va? Ah, said Felix, as the chords wafted through the little door. Jules stood up and bumped her head with a loud thump. Allo? Felix said. He turned down the music. The bird squawked again. Allo, Jules? The little door pushed against Jules's leg. She backed up to let it open. Out strutted Gretchen the cat, tail swishing and chin lifted. Then more awkwardly, the parrot marched out, swinging his whole body around with each step. Then Felix squeezed through, pulling his way by his elbows. I'm sorry, he said, looking up at her. We were too noisy. I couldn't sleep. It wasn't you. It was my brain. Felix stood up, stooped as usual, and opened the fridge. Have you tried our Belgian beer? He held up a jumbo bottle corked like champagne. Share this with me. Alcohol gave Jules hot flashes. She had avoided it well on this trip. Ah, sure, she said, nonetheless, and sat on the sofa while, while he popped the top. The cat alit beside her. The bird flew up to the kitchen counter and wandered around, squawking and bobbing his head while the piano modulated to a single melody meander. Does he like ABBA? He loves ABBA, but it's too late for disco. Is it ever? Felix smiled and brought her a foamy glass of dark beer. The cat stood up to sniff the foam. It is too late for wee birds. This music usually settles him down. Diminished chords rose faintly from the little door. What was behind there, an elf, elf village? Jules said, I'm sorry, that's not my business. He nodded with an inward laugh, my studio. But why is the door so low? It's for winter. Normally I go outside and back in the other hatch, but sometimes I don't want to put on shoes. He wiggled his toes. One foot wore a blue and white striped sock, dirty from floor dust. The other wore pink polka dots. Why does the bird sound like a woman? Jules asked. Maybe I should ask him that question. What's his name? Leonard. He said it with a French accent, three syllables. Leonard. Jules imitated his pronunciation, facing the bird. Where do you get your love of Abba? Abba, said Leonard. Abba. He was my mother's, Felix said. He, he crossed to the pot belly heating stove, fired it higher, then sat in the overstuffed chair opposite Jules, stretching his long legs over a fuzzy orange oval rug, flexing his toes and crossing his ankles. The bird hopped to the back of the chair, then licked his bald head. Leonard outlived her the way they do. I have heard that. Jules sipped the rich beer, hoping it wouldn't make her sloppy. She hadn't eaten much. I never had a parrot. I used to raise chickens. They don't live nearly as long. A chicken can be quite beautiful, he said. Is it weird hearing your mother's voice coming from the bird, she said. Sorry, I have a tendency to do that. Just because you're curious doesn't mean you should ask, my mother used to say. It's okay. It's not weird anymore. Leonard has been mine for 10 years. He rubbed back the plumes on Leonard's head. Right, Cherie? I miss her. Sometimes I want to hear her voice. Was she a fan of Abba? Felix smiled quietly. He nodded. She was. He looked past Jules out the picture window at the snowy canal. When my mother died, I kept the micro cassette from her answering machine, Jules said. It's the only thing of hers that I grabbed. I used to pop it into my machine sometimes just to hear her voice. Hello, you've reached the phone of Pearl Van Patten. So proper and formal that voice had been, mom's telephone voice, that high sweetness she never used with her kids. Van Patten, that's a Dutch name, not Johnson. You took your husband's name? No, that's my stepdad's name. I never married. You? Never found the right person, he said, tilting his head and looking down into his half-empty glass. 
The cat, seeming to sense his melancholy, hopped off the couch and over to his chair, then settled into his lap, flattening and spreading her flesh. Jules put her hand in the warm spot where the cat had been. When did she die, Felix said, your mother? When she was my age, or nearly, next Thursday. I mean, next Thursday, I'll be 52, same as she was. Felix suddenly looked right at her with a solemn expression in his gaunt face. Oh, that's something. Yeah, that's something all right. The piano music changed, became light and fluttery, arpeggiated minor chords, playful and sad all at once. P Felix looked like St. Francis with his bald head and solemn expression surrounded by his animal friends. Leonard bobbed his head in time to the music, fluffing up his plumes. Felix stroked the feather, stroked the feathers back to settle him and looked through the picture window again. Maybe you will have snow for your birthday, he said. Wouldn't be the first time. Can I ask you something else? Can I stop you, he said with a playful lilt. Leonard stepped onto his shoulder and exhaled sleepily. Jules upended her beer, her muscles relaxed from the alcohol. Under her feet, the barge rocked. Can I see your secret room? Your studio? You an artist? I wish, she said. He shooed Gretchen off of his lap, stood up and finished his beer. Follow me. I'll stop there and I will invite Michelle to read. Thank you, Anne. I'm gonna read a couple um flash nonfictions, and there are three of them. So, and the first one is titled, Segways Sealed. It's the holiday, but the bird is gone. Bread crumb, bread crumb stuffing goes on to explore new stomach linings. After the table is cleared, plates scraped, plates stacked, I take the stairs and walk down to the basement floor. Down there, photographs, webbed and mature, glass shards giving grotesque smiles to hands, knees, proud new car owners, pets and portraits, domesticated in frames. A world squared wood, living familiar with silver garland, heelless shoes, generations of rodent shit. I recognize the license plate my sister removed from her Dodge Daytona. The car that hit that dough the year I turned 12. The summer my sister promised to take me camping with five of my friends. Intact, but still wedged against the Wisconsin aluminum. A photo of silhouettes my sister took of me, those friends. The immense lake in the background. In the scene, mist lingers around lake rocks and tween limbs. The six of us balance beaming tree logs and water. We were masts and sails. We dreamt of sailing. To get to that lake, we had to pile into one car instead of splitting in two. My sister's car had already split that dough in two. Six friends and our chaperones, my two sisters, in the family Ford Escort, where I sat in back with our bags and played tic-tac-toe with Stacy. Stacy, who would pile into another car, Five years and five teenagers later, Stacy, who would sail through the windshield of that car with those teens that night, that fall, a mile from my house and weeks from Thanksgiving. This November, I sit in a basement room in the center of a kept world, rest my chin on my knees, so full and digesting all of it the boxes of decorations, the stacks of National Geographics my mother collected when she was alive, the jars of sea glass from Lake Superior, the snapshots, the silhouettes, everything stored in a 12 by 14 cinder block scrapbook, like chambers of a clogged heart, all segues sealed at the seams, it seems, and in silence, bursting. I'll read a second flash nonfiction. And this one is titled, To Ward Off, To Conjure. I'm eating raw garlic again, 
whole bulb, bulb, sorry, I'll start again. I'm eating raw garlic again, whole bulbs of cloves that with a knife press fully and with conscience, enough thought for the outer skin to flip out a corner. I can pick, peel back, expose the slivered white claws. It's enough, this flavor of hot memory of summers out back, of walking the trail from the house to the desperate garden, of following enchantment. Eat whole cloves to keep mosquitoes away. They don't like the scent. Eat it raw to ward off the ticks. It throws off their radar for the flow in your veins. When you're eight and taught two spears of heat will keep away what wants your blood, that tends to stay in your thoughts. Old wives tale or true woods medicine its power saturates through once you hear the words. I return to it every year, every hot day, when I ache to go back to those woods, the hemlock trail that seemed so long, the one that led me from the ramshackle cabin, the one I took with my sisters to watch our mother while she planted tomatoes and sweet corn the deer would eat anyway, despite the paper plates coated with dog hair and tacked to the posts. Another deterrent, Folktale or real, what did it matter? We all love the process. Brushing the dogs and tacking their fur to paper plates on posts. We all love the magic too, the imagined power. Each one of us, a mini sorcerer, wizarding spells, warding off the creatures who wanted us most. And we secretly hoped they'd come. Those demons of ticks, phantoms of mosquitoes, deer of daring, and that we get to witness their surprise at our more awesome powers. As part of the spell, we'd script, four legs befriend, wings and needles take flight, eight legs end. And it made no sense and all the sense, the ticks, the mosquitoes, the deer, even the rabbits. Decades later, the spell becomes prescription each summer I refill. Take two cloves to repel what pest might ail you. Peel back and swallow a bulb to transport to the ache of a garden, the memory you lived the most. And lastly, I'll read this third flash nonfiction. It's titled 16. Only three days ago, I failed my driver's test. With the instructor, I drove down Duck Lake Road, past the supper club to the marina to park parallel along shrink-wrapped yachts. Too late in the season for such storage. Everything bundled, those boats in their casings, bulbous like bruises, bordering on rot. I should have punctured them, torn the blue plastic with the Honda's grill. Instead, I didn't pass, get my license that is, because I drove too slowly, hardly went above 20 miles per hour. In my mind, what failed to translate was the speed of things. How I wanted to careen down that road, to smash and scrape, to have it all become landslide. Listen, I know how it seems as if all I do is the undoing of things. The humidity is so thick today. If I could, I'd sponge the air, then ring out for drops to make you more comfortable. Your hospice bed, a metal cage in that same room where you always read to me, sang to me. I disassemble its bolts and wheels, its skeleton of rails and bars. Now outside, your oldest daughter asks me, your youngest, about the raspberry brambles. How did they get torn apart? Why is there red stomped on the ground, smeared on the trunks along the garden's path? We lean, she and I, against those trees, maples tapped last fall. And all I can do is shrug, let the bark scratch more skin. If I could, Right quickly enough, mother, I'd read to you everything I did today. Thank you. And up next, we have Morgan Talti. 
Thank you, Anne and Michelle. I had to write down so many lines that stuck out from your guys' pieces that I just loved a lot. Um, so today I'm going to read two short pieces. Uh, the first one is called Burn, which is um, from my collection, Night of the Living Res, which is coming out next summer. Um, it was published in Narrative Magazine. Um, if there are any educators out there, I highly recommend subscribing to them. Um, they have a huge free uh, digital library full of um, fiction, nonfiction, everything. Um, so the first piece is Burn, and then the second piece um, is called, is uh, so Burn is fiction, and the second piece is a piece of nonfiction um, I wrote for Decor Maine that's coming out, I think, in December or something um, called Belonging. So I'll start with Burn. Burn. Winter, and I walk the sidewalk at night along banks of hard snow. I just come from Rab's apartment off the reservation. Rab, this white guy with a wide mouth and eyes that closed up when he laughed, sold pot. He was smart too. I'd asked for a gram, and after he weighed it and put it in a plastic baggie, he didn't believe me when I reached into my pants and jacket pockets looking for the cash among the cigarette wrappers and pocket knife. And when I acted the part and kept saying, shit, 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 it must have fell out on the walk over here. He shook his head, took the weed out of the baggie, and put it back into the mason jar. I ain't smoking you up, he said. And so then I said, fuck you, Rab. I really did lose the money. You'll see. Watch when I come back here in 30 minutes with the money I dropped. You'll feel stupid then. He shrugged a sorry man, and I slammed his door shut as I left. At the bridge to the reservation, the river was still frozen, ice shining white blue under a full moon. The sidewalk on the bridge hadn't been shoveled since the last nor'easter crapped snow in November. And I walked in the boot prints everyone made who walked the walk to Overtown to get pot or catch the bus to wherever it was us Indians had to go, which really wasn't anywhere because everything we needed except pot was on the res. Well, except the grocery store or Best Buy or Bed Bath and Beyond, but those natives who bought 4K Ultra DVDs or fresh white doilies had cars, wouldn't be taking the bus like me or Fellas did each day to the methadone clinic. That was another thing the res didn't have, a methadone clinic. But we had sacred grounds where sweats and peyote ceremonies happened once a month, except since I had chosen to take methadone, I was ineligible to participate in native spiritual practice, according to the doc on the res. Natives damning natives. The roads on the res were quiet, trees bending under the weight of snow, and when I passed the frozen swamp, a voice moaned out. I stopped walking. Nothing, so I kept on going on the sparkling road until I heard it again. Who's that? I yelled. The moan came loud, the moan came again. It was a man somewhere in the swamp. I got closer, listening. There it was, low and breathy, and I followed after the noise. The swamp was frozen solid, the snow blown in piles, and so I slid over the ice looking for the source of the noise. Moonlight through bare tree limbs lit the swamp, and caught there among the tree stumps and solid snow was a person sprawled out on the ground. He was trying to sit up but kept falling back like he'd just done 1,000 crunches and was too sore to do just one more. I got close, stood over him. It was Fellas. Fellas, I said, is that you? Fellas tried to sit up, but something pulled him back down. Fuck you, he said, help me. He groaned, shivered. He didn't say how to help him, so I had to squat down and look at him. I flicked my lighter and his purple lip quivered. Hurry, he said. Fellas, I said, I stood up. I can't help you if I don't know what's the matter with you. My hair, he said. I crouched back down and looked at his hair. Holy, I said, and I laughed. He kept his hair braided all the time, but it was undone, his long black hair frozen into the snow. Get me out, D, he said. D, get me out. At first, I tried to pull the hair out from the snow, tried to chip the snow away, but his hair wouldn't come loose. And then I yanked real hard and fellas screamed. Lift your head up, I said. I opened my pocket knife, grabbed his hair in a fistful and cut. When I got through the last bit of hair, Fellas rolled over and away from where he'd been stuck. He rubbed his head like he just woke up. I helped him stand, and we slipped all over the ice on our way out of the swamp. Through dry heaves, Fellas said he missed the bus this morning to the methadone clinic. No shit, I said, because I didn't see him there. And he thought some booze would be good before he got sick from not having any methadone. He had just a bit of booze left when he decided to go see Rab to get some pot. And on the way, he stopped off in the swamp to feel the quiet that came with too much drinking. And when he plopped down in the snow, he dozed right off. When he woke up, his hair was frozen in the snow. I got him to his mom's, where he lived. He walked fine by himself to the door, but I walked with him up the steps. 
I never thought I'd scalp a fellow tribal member, I said. Fuck off, he said. He fumbled in his pocket for his house key. You want to smoke, I said. Didn't you listen? I didn't make it to Rab's. He unlocked the door. I'll go for you, I said. Give me the cash. Fellas looked at me. 20 minutes, I said. I'll run there and back while you warm up your pretty bald head. He gave me 30 bucks, and I didn't ask where he got it from. Yesterday, he said he didn't have any money. 20 bag, fella said, and stop at Jim's and get some tall boys and a bag of chips. Any kind but Humpty Dumpty chips. Too damn salty and my stomach hurts. Down Fellas's driveway, I thought about the look on Rab's face when he saw I had the money. What'd I tell you? How about that, Graham? D, Fellas yelled. Bring me my hair so we can burn it. Don't want spirits after us. We're damned anyway, I said, but I guess I'll get your hair. I kept going, wondering, hair or pot first? Pot made the most sense. It would look strange having to set the hair and ice down like a soaped mop on a counter at Jim's while I reached in my pocket for Fellas's money. Jim, that old wood booger, would say, we don't take those anymore. I'd look him square in his sagging face and say, I ain't trading you, I ain't trading no hair, you old fucker. And I'd smack down on the counter a $10 bill for the tall boys and chips. With the change jingling in my pocket, I'd walk to Rab's and he'd say, get that hair out of here, it's dripping on my floor. And I'd have to plop the hair on the muddy white floor in the hallway while Rab reweighed the same nugs he weighed earlier for me. No, I'd grab Fellas' hair from the swamp on my way home with Fellas on his unmade bed, me on a torn bean bag in the corner, each of us with a tall boy in the pot smoke haze and gray of the room. We'd keep poking and squeezing the hair, the hair, waiting for it to dry, waiting to burn it. So that was burn and this is um, belonging. So this is a nonfiction piece um, coming out into court main. Endings are hard to figure out. I think a lot about what remains of my parents. I don't mean their ashes, which are on my dresser, mom on top of dad. I mean the stuff, the things they surrounded themselves with in life. Everything I own of my father's fits in a thinning plastic bag, three dirty appointment books, two red, one blue, that he used for his once prosperous moving company, a stack of business cards for taxi companies and Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun and the wound care clinic where he had his venous ulcers treated, several Powerball tickets, scratch-offs that he always let me scratch, one hasn't been touched, a small pile of loose torn paper, a note my father wrote to a nurse who was kind to him but he seems to not have handed it to her, a photo of me when I was a teenager, glasses with a maroon cord, a birthday card I sent him in a black comb. Out of the slim pickings of my father's items in that thinning plastic bag is one item I cherish the most, a price right receipt, a list of purchases he made the day before he died of a massive heart attack. The time of purchase is almost illegible, 11.14 a.m. on June 3rd, 2012. And all but three items are still readable. Chunky chicken soup, hamburger helper, a single can of crushed tomatoes, Nesquik chocolate powder, a bottle of tomato ketchup, one Rinaldi spaghetti sauce, angel hair pasta, pancake syrup, Lay's barbecue chips, peaches and grapes, one pound 80% ground beef, two strawberry banana yogurts, a stick of salted butter, whole milk ricotta, Sunny D delight, a gallon of milk, haagen Dulce de Leche ice cream, and a pack of 10 USA foil pans. All of this came to a total of $90.38, and I can picture my overweight father bounce, balancing all of these bags on one of, his electric, on one of his electric scooters. He had two, one he stole from the hospital, as he vroomed home to his apartment in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I can see, have envisioned, a world in which his food did not go to waste because he did not die, a world in which he had two electric scooters to choose from. A receipt is evidence of payment, but this receipt is much more than that. It's evidence of a life still wanting to live. For every one item I have of my father's, I have at least two dozen of mom's things. Well, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds nice and is probably pretty accurate. So much more of my mother remains in the objects she left behind. They're in my garage and I pass by them daily. Her smell of cigarette smoke emanating from the objects and filling the air like she had just left the garage before I entered it. Like I'm always just missing her by half a second, but she's gone for good and all I have is her stuff. A lot of it, even though my sister and I sorted through all of it and split things between us. 
you sure you don't want this? She asked. And I said I was sure, even though I wanted some things I gave up, as I imagined she did too, lying about something she wanted and letting me have it. I've yet to go through everything I took from moms, but I have gone through the things that are most special to me. Her cedar chest filled with clothes, but more importantly, her knickknacks, the miniatures of larger things that I always like to play with, an apple and corn that fit in a small metal pot, a very tiny jar filled with colored circles, candy, four small books bound in twine, small Coca-Cola bottles, and small plastic Star Wars men, one of Chewbacca carrying a broken C-3PO on his back as they escaped Cloud City and another of Han Solo riding a Tauntaun, searching for Luke on planet Hoth. When mom moved us to Maine, to the Penobscot nation, leaving my father behind in the mess of his gambling and other addictions, I remember standing on a chair as I helped her put all of these items and more on the brown shelves she nailed to the walls around the house. And I remember putting my small toy figurines on the shelves with her own belongings. And they stayed there until mom moved off the reservation when I graduated high school, when I no longer cared about those Star Wars figurines. And when she unpacked, she put them back on the shelves until she moved one final time to Bangor, where again, she put them all back on her shelves around her apartment. She'll never place them again on any shelf, but I'm sure she would have liked to. The week before she died of a heart attack, I was helping to get her silver two-door Hyundai registered online. The last text I have from her is about the miles on her vehicle when I needed to finish the registration. 97,433. Just like my father intended to keep on going, so too did mom and her car, the one sitting out front now with deflated tires. I'm going to fix it up and sell it, give half of the money to my sister and put the other half toward what I've always wanted, a writer's shed, a place where I can write, certainly, but a place that feels just like a story, forever immortal, a place whose walls I'll cover with the brown shelves for my mother, decorating them with all the miniature objects she owned. And in my desk drawer, I'll keep that thinning plastic bag full of my father's belongings. Maybe like a coat, I'll hang his glasses up by its maroon cord. Maybe, just maybe, like evidence on a board in a police station, I'll tack his receipt and loose papers and various business cards and that one unscratched scratch ticket across a wall or two. I'll study all the belongings from both of them as if eventually I'll uncover some important truth about what it means to live, to write, in the absence of my parents, in the absence of my creators. And I imagine my wife coming down to the shed, sitting behind me and reading on the small couch I plan to have in there. Even better, I imagine our future children, imagine bringing them here to this place, to my writer's shed decorated with the things that belong to their grandparents, to Carol Morgan and to John Talty. And I'll tell them the wildest stories about the people they never met, but whose blood runs through their veins. My children don't even exist yet, but I know they'll want to play with the knickknacks and scratch the scratch tickets like I did. And as they are each occupied, busy with the belongings of the ones they never knew, I'll sit down or maybe I'll be a standing writer by that point and I'll get to work telling the right story that will end exactly as it's supposed to. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That was wonderful. Um, I'm going to let um, Josh take a look at Facebook and see if there's anything he needs to report on before we start our chat. But while he does that, I'm um, going to come back to that comment that I made before that um, where I said that all the pieces sort of seem to weave together in a way. And I started listening to you because you know, I had read these pieces beforehand. And I started listening to you and I thought, what am I talking about? Like these have three very different voices, really different content, um, you know, different settings. Why, why did I say that? And, I, and, and yet as Michelle, as you moved into your pieces, I started to feel that same thing I was feeling when Anne had been reading. And then the same thing happened to me again with Morgan. And I realized that there's just, I think they all resonate in the same way for me. You are all sort of tackling that same place um, that legacy inheritance speaks to. Last night we had readings that connected to sort of um, bigger themes, uh, larger groups. Each of these pieces felt very intimate and deeply personal. Um, and so I, th I think that's where I was coming from with that. And, it, and it, it, it did it again, it took me again. It sort of all wove together. It seemed like this, this lovely sort of continuous piece. So thank you very much for that, um, Josh. 
what did you find out? Yeah, well, I'll just add on to what you're saying, Claire, that, yeah, I feel like all three pieces today really speak to, like, artifacts of memory, um, because uh, all of them are about things very much left behind and the, the memories associated, um, kind of like Morgan ended with, with, with a, an ongoing story. But um, I feel like all three pieces really kind of touched on that imagery um, and just the, the, yeah, the, the resonance of objects that outlast um, sometimes the, the people that first gave them meaning. Um, which is just, it, it was lovely. I, 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 I'm so struck listening to all three of you. Um, and it's really the, the pleasure that Claire and I get from doing this is just being able to sit with the storytelling that um, so many people do. Um, over on Facebook, um, Gary is here as well, who's one of our regulars and um, normally documents us. Um, and so he, he just wanted to add in as well, um, delightful stories. And he says he loves the detailed descriptions that create the spaces of these. So uh, thank you, Gary, as well. Um, if anyone who is listening has other comments or questions, uh, we're going to move into our discussion, but feel free to um, drop that in and we'll get to as much as possible um, before we, we wrap up today. Um, but Claire, I'll hand it back to you if you want to start us off with some conversation. I will do that. Um, first, I just want to comment again on how lucky we are. We were talking about this yesterday after the reading as well. Our, um, we just have such so much talent here in Maine, so many wonderful writers who like to join up with us and, and uh, do these readings for us. And it makes us feel very, very smart. Um, uh, we feel so powerful after these. We just can't believe what we helped make happen because you guys are just so wonderful. Um, so Anne, I'll start with you since you've been resting longest. Um, I would love it if you could talk a little bit about the research that you, I mean, you clearly had to do a lot of research. And again, I read more um, than you read for, for our listeners. So I know that there's a lot of research that went into that piece. Um, so if you wanna talk a little bit about that and how that affects your writing process, I would love to hear that. Sure, so just um, to fill in about the parts that, that weren't read, that you saw Claire, um, she writes in her journal about what she's doing. And so she's on a, she's on a trip to Europe to look at uh, specific paintings that she's been teaching for years. And so one of them is in Bruges. Um, it's a, a portrait by Jan van Eyck uh, of Canon van der Peel. Um, and so I had to see the painting if I wanted to write this story and I just have discovered a lot along the way that, that you can see very good reproductions of paintings online. Of course, I can't travel now to do any of this research, but I did take a very low budget trip uh, to Northern Europe to look at very early portraits with the beginning of our portraiture tradition and to sort of imagine the life of an art historian. I've been writing about artists for years, but to, to think about what an art historian is thinking about is, is a different mindset. I spent a lot of time in museums, but I also happen to stay in this weird barge in Bruges, which was one of the more affordable places to stay. And um, it was quite an experience. There was a snowstorm, the boat was rocking and the room was too short for me and I'm not that tall. Uh, and and, and uh, there was no bird there. The bird just kind of appeared as I was writing it. So then I had to research bird, you know, a, a, I liked the idea of um, hearing the voices of the dead in, in different forms. And so the idea of a parrot came to me. And, and so, um, so that's, and so I did, I did a little online research about birds. I did not go get a bird or anything like that. That would be pretty hardcore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to create some, some uh, focal point, I guess, so that the two of them could become friends. And then she goes into a studio and sees his work, which is also portraiture, uh, which is, you know, I, I tend to use coincidence a lot to drive my plots, but I'll own up to that. So that's that, that's that. A <laughs> um, lot, of, lot of reading and a lot of looking at images, looking at them repeatedly, um, which is I think the most important piece of if you're gonna do like ekphrasis uh, is to just look hard. Yeah. Do you find that you have a hard time um, um, 
limiting your research? Like, do you dive so deeply that you end up spending a, more time than you think you should in the research? Um, I see a lot of art and this much makes it in. Yeah. 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 But it's really fun, right? I love the atmosphere. And, and you know, Bruges is a city that's all about atmosphere. So, um, yeah. It's like that that thing Hemingway said about the iceberg, you know, that you're you're yeah. writing the little tip, but you have to know everything underneath in order to hold that little tip up. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna barrel right through and ask Michelle my question. If if no one else wants to jump in, anyone else? All right, Michelle, I write a lot of micros and flashes, um, and I teach a workshop in in this form. And one of my favorite um, endings, kind of kinds of endings, kind of endings uh, to use myself, and I try to, um, I have samples of it in in my workshop, um, is this kind of ending where um, you introduce something brand new at the very end. You're, you know, like you're sort of you have this wonderful moment going, and you're reflecting on the this what you've been building throughout this short piece. And then you use, just as you're ending, you use that space to open everything up rather than to tie it off. And mm -hmm. I, I'm just particularly fond of that kind of ending. And I notice that a lot of your pieces have it. Um, and in particular, uh, the third one that you read um, really makes good use of that type of ending, I think. Um, and I was wondering if you would like to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, partly with, with the flash nonfiction, I, I, I tend to, think of structuring those almost as I would structure a poem, but not all poems. Um, so I, I think of where that turn needs to come in. Um, and when it comes with these, you know, these usually there are these short blocks of prose, I, I think about having that turn come towards the end. I mean, partly just because that's how the, if there is a, a straightforward narrative, how that kind of unfolds and it's not in, till the end that I think maybe we're ready for that turn. But I, I partly I, I like putting that in there, you know, in that particular moment of a piece because it it ultimately makes the reader go back and reread the piece. And it's such a short piece. I mean, and maybe that's what we do with poems too. And not all poems end with that gut punch last line, although a lot do. And I like those poems that do that. Um, so I think it's it's you know it's it's a number of things, but I, I think I, I tend to write these, these flash nonfiction narratives that sometimes do become poems um, with that sort of buildup until the end. And then there's that you know, change of atmosphere, change of voice sometimes, um, or because it's, it's nonfiction, so it needs to be true. Um, I'm very dedicated to that. Uh, that's just how the story unfolds. That's where I was in the thought process, such as when I was 16, you know, but of course, taking the memory and then sort of manipulating it as, as, as you can when you write about it years later. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the one that I read in third place, um, which was the 16 one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, where that kind of reflection comes back. And then the realization, um, you know, that the, me, I suppose, because I am the narrator, is uh, really thinking about talking to her mother uh, again and, and what um, I wish I could have done or what I still wish I could do is tell you everything that I've done today. So, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a little sort of lift off, you know, into, yeah. oh, this is what I was talking about all along. And it, it's, you know, it, it has a little bit of a, a sense of surprise to it. Yeah. When I also, there was a piece I didn't read today, but um, some of these are modeled after, again, a poetic form, but the haiboon, where it's this prose, um, chunk of prose, prose paragraph. And then the last three lines are uh, in the form of haiku. And, and often the, the tone is ominous. It doesn't have to be. And then those last three lines, it's not necessarily that those last three lines connect to the preceding paragraph, but they, they shift it a bit. They make you look at it differently. And so I think maybe once I learned that form, I kind of just adopted it with, with a lot of my flash nonfiction. That is really interesting. I've, I've seen some high boon um, in 
um, I don't know if you get, if you've ever looked at the, um, oh, what, what's it called? The, the best micros, the, oh, that, yeah, yeah. that anthology. Yeah. They, they do a lot of high boards in, yeah. in those. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I've got one for Morgan. If we're, everybody is sleepy today. Um, that image of the frozen hair, Morgan, just kept me going. As soon as I figured out what was going on with the character, I just couldn't stop thinking about it and wondering just how close his head was to the ground and how did this happen? Like, how, how was it melted enough? And then how did it free? You know, you just, it just I got completely tangled up in it. Um, uh, so I was just, it, it's just so striking and, and what a great, great image to build a piece on. And I was just wondering how that came to, if you wanted to talk about the inspiration for that detail. Yeah, I totally made that story up. Um, no, I actually, so I'd heard, um, I don't know, this was maybe in like 2017 or 2018, a friend was visiting and um, he was telling me, um, he was non-native, um, but he had met a, he'd met a guy who was also non-native and uh, they were both chatting and somehow it came up with the, they were, they both knew people from the reservation, um, the Penobscot nation, or they knew indigenous people in Maine. And he asked my friend if he knew this person and he's like, no, why? And he's, and he told him this story and he said he was crossing this bridge one night and there was this guy at the other end of the bridge in a laying back in a pile of snow. He was drunk, he was a native guy and his hair was, was frozen in the snow. And, and he, uh, so this, this non-native guy, um, I guess he was laughing when he was telling the story because I was laughing when I was hearing this story because it's so absurd. And he's, he, the guy was saying he was like cutting this native's hair off and like looking over his shoulder and making sure no one was like looking, like it felt like so bad. Like, like we think of scalping, right? And the, the terrible history with scalping. Yet in this instance, in contemporary times, he's cutting this indigenous person's hair off to save his life. Um, so I thought like, like, the story itself was just absolutely hilarious. Like, I just thought it was so funny um, and, and sad also. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna, you know, bury the, you know, use humor to cover that, the, the sadness of it. But um, I, w I mean, once I heard that, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm, I'm gonna steal stuff. Um, I was like, I need to write about this. And I tried to write about it as like an essay, you know, really thinking about this idea of like hair and stuff, but it just, it was so removed. Like I, like I'd heard the story through like someone else's mouth who had heard it, you know, who had experienced it. So nonfiction wasn't allowing me to get as close to the subject as, as possible. So I was like, I'm just going to write this as, as fiction. And, um, I wrote burn ultimately. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's sort of the inspiration for it. I, it was sort of like one genre failed me. So I had to use another, well, I've said this too many times uh, at this point, but I'm going to say it again, that fiction is the way that I tell the truth all the time. You know, sometimes that's just, that's the right framing for it. Um, I'm much better at telling the truth in fiction than in uh, nonfiction. And I do think you walk that line um, perfectly between the, you know, the sadness and the comedy. Um, you, you manage to capture both in the piece and you walk the line properly. Like no one, no one is laughing at this guy. You know, you're, you're sort of laughing with the absurdity of the situation and how they are sort of pulling together to connect in this really powerful way, you know? Yeah, I think too, I tried to write it intentionally. So it was so that like, there wasn't one emotion evoked by this, by that scene, you know, like if you thought it was funny, you could laugh. If you thought it was like shocking, you could be shocked. You know, I mean, I think that's how we should always sort of approach mm -hmm work you know what I mean so I was like when I read it I always find it funny but and, and it's and it's interesting to hear people listen to it because I've read it you know other places and I don't hear people laugh at that part um even though I think it's I think it's funny um yeah but yeah it, it's it's you know it's interesting what a reader brings to the page it's also shocking when you're expecting a laugh and you don't get one I've had that experience um, yeah 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 um, go ahead Josh 
Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of follow up with another question. Um, and I'll start with Morgan, but then if Michelle or Anne wants to jump in as well. Um, the, I'm always curious with people who do move between forms so strongly, and you, you touched on this a little bit already, like trying to write nonfiction, and then it um, ended up being a, fi a fiction piece instead. But just kind of like for your process and when you're starting something new, do you mind talking just a little bit about what is it like moving between forms just kind of as a um, creator? Um, because like it's all creative writing, but it, it functions so differently in some key ways. Yeah, um, I. it's funny as I, when I first started writing, I started, I, when I first started to learn writing and like taking classes, I was mostly in nonfiction area doing like memoir stuff and yets and like um you know slice of life things and so that's really how i learned to write and i and i began to notice in those spaces that um there were a lot of moments where i could let imagination run um and you know the, the piece would become fictional um but for many years i wrote just nonfiction. i wrote just memoir stuff um and then i don't know something just like something that nonfiction couldn't, I couldn't get to work in nonfiction. So I went to fiction and um, I, 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 I write both. I mean, I think I'm more well known for my fiction than I am for my nonfiction. Um, I say well known, like I'm known anyways. Um, <laughs> um, but, but my fiction is what I mostly publish. And I guess choosing what, which genre to use, um, really depends i mean because sometimes i'll have almost oh like my default i think my default is fiction now so when i have um unless i specifically have something i want to write about like the belongings piece um that was something that's been something i've been working on with those pieces for years trying to figure out um and i still don't even think it's the piece i want to write but um usually you know, I, I hear this sounds weird, but in the morning, I'll, you know, in the quietness of the morning, you know, you get to thinking of voices and of sayings. And, you know, I keep a list of stuff I hear, stuff that comes to me. And I use a lot of that as just a foundation to go with, with fiction. Um, so like, like I said, my, my default is usually fiction. Um, and it's my default if I can't get nonfiction to work um, as well. Um, but with nonfiction, I usually will know like, okay, I'm going to write this essay about family or something. I think that answers your question. Yeah, no, it, it does. Um, we talked a little bit last night about how um, I always de default to fiction just because nonfiction is so intimidating to me. Um, we and we talked about the, really the vulnerability it takes to put yourself on the page like that. Um, so whenever I hear from people who do, do nonfiction or move between both, Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just always kind of curious what drives that. So yeah, thank you for um, for talking about it some. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and I will say too with nonfiction is I get like, I get scared of uh, like hurting people, you know, with nonfiction, you know, if you're telling narratives and you bring in other people's lives and I think it's, I'm safer in fiction if, you know, when I'm in that, in that place um, because nonfiction is, you know, there's so much more effort you know, ethics involved with that. I'm not saying fiction doesn't have ethics. It has tons of ethics, but there's a different set of parameters, I think, around nonfiction. That's um, certainly true, but take it from me, the first story that I wrote and got published in a newspaper, actually, it was a local contest when I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina. I, I took it from a childhood story that um, said some not such great things about some members of my family. And I thought it was safe because I changed names and I, and I, you know, I changed things around enough that it, you know, I fictionalized it. I really fictionalized it. Um, but it obviously struck a chord because within two days of that being published, I got a call from my mother saying that one of my aunts had reached out to her and, and they had traveled all through the cousins. And I mean, my family's in Virginia, they don't even live in North Carolina. And somehow that North Carolina paper made it immediately to my family. So just beware that if you do use real people in, in a piece of fiction, you've really got to disguise it well. Yeah, you, you do. That's, I've had similar experiences. <laughs> 
Uh, Michelle or Anne, do you care to comment on forms and just cr creative expression or really anything that um, you want to add before we wrap up? <laughs> I was just saying, go ahead. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I guess um, it's interesting to me that we're talking about nonfiction and fiction and I often think of nonfiction and poetry. Um, and it's just because I think nonfiction is so malleable. There's, there's so many different modes um, and, and sub forms of it. Um, but I guess when I start writing, I, I don't know, I, I probably always think more of um, the lyricism of it. So maybe I think of poem more than I think of um, narrative and 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 and, and I, I don't uh, my poems aren't true my poems might ha have slices of my life and experience of course but they're not nonfiction and with nonfiction oddly it's there's a freedom because the story and what happened happened and you can't really mess with that at least I don't feel like you can so with poetry I mean there's also a freedom and probably with fiction because you can make it up I think you can and um it's just the challenge then is to, you know, heighten the, the lyricism of it and the music and, and um, you know, perhaps the form, so. I don't have much to add. <laughs> I've, I've been experimenting with collage, which I guess is, is yet another thing where you have to think about your sources and using them in an ethical way. And, um, so, yeah. Do you well, mean writ written collage or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Working with, um, you know, news sources and uh, mm -hmm. journals. Um, I have my mother's journals. I have my own journals. Mixing yeah. it up, and seeing what comes up. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. And Michelle, when you said, uh, I think you said that nonfiction is more malleable. That that surprised me because I think of fiction as so much more malleable, but, but I write fiction in, in a lot of different forms, mm -hmm. you know, like a form of a letter or a form of a product label or. Yeah. Yeah. I think the same can be said for, for nonfiction. Like we call it flash. We call it micro essay. I and mean, there's also many names for, which is basically the same thing, but, and then we say memoir. And, mm -hmm. um, I think there are many people that would, um, call all these different types of, of writings different things. Um, we house it under creative nonfiction or some people house it all up under memoir, but that's not true, you know, necessarily if you're writing reportage or more literary um, nonfiction, which is you know, kind of takes in the, you know, a news story, but then brings in the writer's voice. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess I like to think it was malleable just because there's so many ways that you can write the truth, um, but in, in different fashions um, and collage being one as well. So, you know. no, it's, it's absolutely true. But, I, but I'm thinking about how our brains process these things differently and why we write in the genres that we do. For me, like my brain automatically thinks, oh, if I'm going to mold something and play with it, I, it's going to be fiction. It, like I feel very constrained by creative nonfiction. I really think I have to get it right. I have to, you know, just write a nice sentence and that's all I got. And if, and if that's too hard, you know, I, I run right back to my fiction as Joshua was saying, because that is where I find I have freedom and, you know, I can mold things. So I just feel like we're sort of, seems like we, you know, depending where you land in your, your primary genre tends to be kind of how you think about things and, you know, what what were uh, who knows it's a it's all so mysterious but really fun yeah. yes for sure um we are right about at time so i will wrap us up for the evening um gary has one more thanks to everyone involved today for the readings thanks gary um, yeah looking yeah. forward to seeing you in person sometime soon hopefully yeah, so um, but yeah, th thank you to everyone who tuned in um whether you watch this live or if you come back to this after the fact um, all of our virtual readings are available on Facebook and YouTube, so share them with anyone that you think would enjoy them. And we will be back um, next month for the final reading of our 2021 season. Um, we've got another great lineup of um, returning and um, possibly some new guests as well for the series. 
Um, so we're very much looking forward to that. Um, but for today, Anne and Michelle and Morgan, thank you. Um, it's always such an honor to have a platform where people are willing to share work. Because I mean, we all know at the end of the day, it takes, it, uh, it's a step to come into a space like this and share something that is so near and dear to you. And so we're always very aware of that and um, touched by um, this experience. So it has been a pleasure today, but um, we will be back and uh, everyone keep reading, keep writing, keep telling stories um, because we need more art in the world always. So thank you and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.